Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm I'm going actually live on sure. Facebook to stream Facebook Live. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Zoom. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're gonna wait just a couple more minutes. Um for everyone to join us and then we will start our webinar. Yep, just let me know when I should jump in. I'm good whenever. Sure. Yeah, I'll just give it one more, couple more minutes. And we can start. And everybody get settled. Thank you for spending your Friday evening. With yes, us. thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so I think it's it's nine o'clock, and let's um let's begin. Awesome. So, yeah. So thank you everyone for uh, for joining us tonight. My name is Claudia Gotti from ADHD Online. And uh, for those who are new to our platform, um, I'd like to introduce um, our company. Um, ADHD Online is a platform that allows you to receive a formal evaluation and treatment for ADHD from our network of licensed psychologists. Um, we are um, also providing these free resources, the webinars, um, that cover important and popular ADHD topics related to um, ADHD with one simple goal, and this is to improve awareness and to empower our community to live their best lives. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. And Dr. Amy Marshall is a licensed psychologist in South Dakota. And Dr. Marshall works primarily with children and adolescents and is certified in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and telemental health. In addition to individual and family therapy, she completes psycholo psychological assessments for ADHD. And her um, the topic of tonight is ADHD and sleep hygiene. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I am. I'm Dr. Marshall. I'm uh, coming from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, this evening. Uh, about a month ago, I did one of these webinars for ADHD and autism spectrum disorder and the overlap there in the assessments. Um, some parents who participated in that webinar had asked some questions about helping their kids who have a diagnosis of ADHD with some sleep problems. So we thought that that would be a good topic to cover, give some more resources on sleep hygiene, um, because sleep is something that can be challenging for people with ADHD. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight about a lot of things that can specifically help if your child has ADHD to help them sleep, um, but also that adults with ADHD can also use to be able to sleep. Um, if you have any questions as we're going, there is a Q&A option on Zoom. Uh, you're welcome to type that in whenever. I will be doing, um, I won't be looking at them until the end, uh, but if you think, oh, I might not remember this when she says it's time for questions, you can type it in at any time. Um, I'm also an author. Uh, my book, I Don't Want to Be Bad, is available on Amazon, um, paperback, and uh, on the Kindle store, uh, just as something, a little resource to help parents with kids to make better choices, communicate their feelings in a healthy way. Um, so I'll kind of jump in with ADHD and sleep hygiene. If the PowerPoint will cooperate with me. There we go. Um, so sleep hygiene refers basically to the behaviors, the rituals, and the environmental factors that affect your sleep, um, the choices that you make then it, that can improve your quality of sleep. Uh, this more complex definition here on the slide, um, the Sleep Foundation is a nonprofit organization. Uh, they promote sleep as an essential component to your health, and they have some good resources about um, sleep hygiene and how to get the best sleep that you can. Um, some of the research that we have on sleep is kind of limited, uh, and that is because what we need as far as sleep does vary from person to person. 
Um, you're probably familiar with, we get told, you know, eight hours a night is ideal, um, but there's actually some genetic components that some people don't really function well on eight hours. They need more like 10 hours. And some people have a genetic, uh, a genetic mutation that they really only need more like five or six hours. They don't need that full eight hours. Um, so a big part of sleep hygiene is not about finding this one size fits all, here is what everyone should do. It's about giving you the tools to find out what you as an individual most need or what your child most needs. So how much sleep you need, what system is it that works best for you? Um, so sleep and ADHD uh, are pretty tied together. A lot of people with ADHD do struggle with sleep and there's a few different reasons for this. Uh, one is that the ADHD brain has a different um, day and night kind of cycle. So uh, for some people with ADHD, they are maybe cognitively at their best um, later in the evening versus for a lot of neurotypical people like early to mid afternoon. Um, so there's, there's maybe a need for those times that sleep cycle to be a little bit different of a schedule than what we see as typical. Um, there is also in the ADHD brain a strong need for structure and routine, while at the same time not really liking to stick to a consistent routine and schedule. Um, the more you stick to the routine, the easier it is to do and the more benefit you get from it. But it's very hard to start that because it takes energy to create this routine. It takes energy to be consistent with this routine. And when you're exhausted, you don't really have the energy to implement these changes and you're kind of in that vicious cycle, it can be hard to break out of. Um, and when you're not getting enough sleep, other symptoms of ADHD, the fidgeting, the hyperactivity, the impulsive behavior, the focus issues can be worse, worsened by fatigue. Um, people who have the hyperactive and impulsive type of ADHD or the combined presentation, which includes those hyperactive impulsive symptoms, will have a lot of difficulty winding down and settling down, calming themselves, getting into the headspace of being restful. Uh, in addition, people with all the different types of ADHD tend to be more sensitive to stimuli. So for example, if you're lying in bed and it's quiet and it's dark and the air conditioner kicks on or the heater kicks on, someone with ADHD, that's going to be, oh, now I'm wide awake because I heard a sound kind of what was that. Um, and then the flip side of the inattention is that people with ADHD can have periods of hyper focus on a preferred activity and just completely get into the flow of that. And then the next thing you know, it's five hours later and it's three o'clock in the morning and oh no, I was going to go to bed at 10. Um, and then finally, uh, stimulant medications such as Adderall, Vyvanse, Ritalin, um, stimulant by definition can cause difficulty with falling asleep. That's not the case for everyone, but that can be a factor for some people with ADHD. So sleep hygiene consists of a number of different things. Uh, first of all, there's that routine, which is one, having a relatively consistent sleep schedule. This doesn't necessarily mean, you know, in bed, lights out at 1030 on the dot every night, but having kind of a range of say 10 to 11 or for younger children, you know, eight to nine, that they're going to bed within that same time frame every night can also help to wake up around the same time every day. Sleep hygiene, I'm talking a lot this evening about what goes into sleep hygiene for uh, for going to sleep, but you can also have similar routines on the other side of sleep hygiene of your ritual in the morning that that helps you wake up, helps you be alert. Um, so the that following the same pattern um, basically starts to train your brain that when I engage in these behaviors, it means it's time to wind down. It means I'm going to sleep soon. So that's where these behaviors and these rituals come into place. Um, it's one thing that can be pretty easy is to incorporate tasks that you have to do anyway to get ready for bed. Um, you know, say I need to brush my teeth, I need to put my pajamas on, I need to, you know, take out my contacts, that if you do those in the same order, in the same way, right before you lie down in bed, it trains your brain, okay, brushing my teeth means I'm going to sleep soon. Putting on my pajamas means I'm going to sleep soon. It's time to be calm. 
Um, the other part of that is those calming kind of activities. So uh, it's not a good part of a bedtime routine, you know, to, to put on Halo and to be playing a shooter game for a little while, things that like bring up your heart rate and things like that. Um, so following the ritual at night to help you feel more restful and then a similar ritual in the morning to help you be awake. Um, and with kids, especially, you can have these kind of rituals around tucking them in that can help with this. Um, as far as the environment, uh, when we are looking at screens, like all of us are right now, um, if you don't have a blue light filter turned on, our brains think that the screen means that the sun is up and it's daytime and it's time to be awake. So um, having that blue filter or saying, okay, from this point on in the evening, we don't do screens anymore can help your brain to realize it's nighttime. It's time to rest and go to sleep. Um, music can also bring down that that physiological arousal, bring bring in that kind of calming environment um, would have to be, uh, you know, again, calming music, not something upbeat that you want to dance to. Um, and it, although playing the same song over and over can get pretty boring <laughs> if you have, you know, a similar kind of genre of music. So again, your brain is learning. This means it's time to, to be restful. This means it's time to go to bed. Um, there's all there's uh, some certain scents that can be very relaxing. So tying those scents to your sleep routine um, can help with that. So how do we create this routine? Uh, like I said, there's not one right way to do it. Everyone has different needs. I talked about um, hygiene kinds of tasks can be part of this routine as, um, you know, I need to brush my teeth anyway. So teaching my brain that this means it's time to go to bed. Um, one example of how this needs to be individualized for each person. I, for example, right after I take a shower, I feel very alert. So for me, showering at night is not a good part of sleep hygiene routine. That's better of a morning sleep hygiene routine that I'm, I'm awake, I'm ready, you know, I'm, I'm clean. Uh, some kids, if they take, especially if they take baths, they might find that time to be a very soothing kind of time. So making it part of that bedtime routine uh, with kids, especially to letting them have a say in what the routine is going to be telling them, hey, we're going to create this, this bedtime routine to help you sleep better. And then they're, well, they're going to be more compliant because they feel in control and they're making decisions, but also they can tell you this, this makes me feel relaxed. This makes me feel less relaxed. Um, so there's lots of options. Like I said, there could be the quiet, soothing music. There can be either no screen time an hour or longer before bed or blue light filter only, uh, reading stories that are calming. If the family has a particular religious practice that they follow, having prayer time around bedtime. Um, and then if you're looking at to say if you have, you know, some pillow spray or something like that with a soothing smell like lavender or chamomile. Um, that again, your brain ties that scent into, oh, this is what, this is what helps me sleep. Um, it can be, it's, it's kind of funny how we train our brains um, to do these things that I couldn't, I, I was trying with the aromatherapy for myself for a while. And um, I have a perfume with lavender in it. So I said, well, I either can't wear that perfume anymore, or I need a different scent to associate with bedtime. Um, but those are kind of some different options that can go into that routine and kind of creating that routine. Uh, one thing in particular that kids will struggle with around bedtime is resisting going to bed because they're feeling worried or they're feeling anxious, um, particularly with uh, individuals with ADHD. When you lie down to go to sleep, worrying thoughts pop into your head that you were distracted from during the day or you might look back on a social interaction that was uncomfortable and that's now weighing on your brain and it's difficult to fall asleep. This, this isn't limited to ADHD. Um, I think everyone's had a time where they, you know, late at night think of something awkward, whether it's from that day or from a long time ago. And they're, now they're dwelling on that instead of falling asleep. Um, and it's the fact that we're no longer distracted by our days anymore. We're laying there and then just anything kind of pops up and it's hard to let go of worrying thoughts. They tend to stick because they get that, that chemical, that anxiety reaction. Um, there are different ways to kind of put away those worries. So, and um, I kind of wrote this thinking of my work with kids and teenagers, um, but I think it applies to adults pretty well too. 
Um, basically, you can have a routine and it can be part of that, that hygiene routine, that bedtime routine of we're putting the worries away until tomorrow. And this doesn't, again, need to look a specific way, but examples of this can be um, you're going to imagine a box and you're going to take each worry and you're going to put it in the box and they're going to be safe in there. And now the box is closed and the worries need to stay in there and the worries can't come out until morning. Um, for kids who don't do as well with the visualizations, they could do, they're going to write, they could write it down and either physically put a scrap of paper in a box or write it down in a notebook that's then closed and that's going to hold that worry. Um, I've, I've heard of kids also saying, you know, I have my, I'm going to tell it to my doll and my doll is going to hold it for, in, for the nighttime so that I can go to sleep. Um, can also try replacing the worry thoughts with we're going to list some things that we're grateful for or that we're happy about and we're going to visualize that instead to kind of replace the worry thoughts that way. Um, so that's because that's one place where you can get a lot of resistance around the bedtime routine is but but what about the test tomorrow or but what about this argument that I had today or the kind of the, the anxious thoughts that pop up like that. Uh, another thing, uh, important component of sleep hygiene is having specific uh, guidelines or rules for in your bedroom or in your child's bedroom. Um, just like how that ritual around bedtime teaches your brain, okay, it's going to be time to rest soon. I'm doing the things I do before I fall asleep. Having the room itself be, this is the space where I sleep can help your brain to notice, okay, now that I'm in this room, that means it's time to rest and it's time to sleep. Um, a lot of people don't have the option to say, I sleep in my bedroom and I do nothing else there because, you know, space. Um, but as much as possible, you know, if the child does their homework in their room and they have a desk, if the desk can be facing away from their bed, um, don't ever want them sitting on their bed to play or to do schoolwork, um, that the bed is a restful place and we just all we do here is sleep because that kind of again promotes that it's time you know this is where I go when I'm going to sleep um, so when you're creating the sleep environment um, a lot of people their ideal sleep environment is completely dark silent um, and that is not always the best environment for someone with ADHD um, because like I mentioned that um, the ADHD brain is very in tune with any kind of stimulation. So if there's, you know, wind, uh, siren goes by outside, heater kicks on, and then, oh, now I'm awake and I'm focused on that. So having some kind of sound or something like that to, uh, to basically uh, cover up those smaller sounds is helpful. Um, it can be helpful to have a white noise machine. It can also... Uh, sometimes be more helpful to have something like a podcast going. Um, and that can also help with those anxious thoughts like I was talking about, um, because you're listening kind of to a storyline or to an explanation. So it's kind of your brain is focused on this and it's something that's relaxing and it's something that's calming, um, but it's also keeping those other kind of anxious thoughts from spiraling. Um, question a lot of times that we get about kids, but again, applies to adults as well. Uh, what if I wake up during the nighttime? What if my child wakes up during the nighttime? Uh, first of all, I recommend keeping a water bottle um, on the nightstand if possible. That way, if what woke you up is that you were coughing or your throat was a little bit dry, you don't have to get out of bed to meet that need. You can just take a drink and lay down. Um, if possible, generally, you would want to stay in bed because that's gonna keep you as close to that restful state as possible. Um, it can be incredibly boring and frustrating to lie awake in bed, but if you get up and start doing things, then that tells your body, okay, it's time to be awake. That tells your brain, I was right to wake up because it was time to wake up because you then got up and were doing things. And it's more difficult to fall asleep later because you've then increased that, that arousal, you're up, you're moving, you're doing things. Um, it can be helpful to remember that laying in bed in the dark with your eyes closed is still restful and is still good for your body and good for your brain. It's not as good as actually being asleep, but an hour of that type of rest 
is better than spending that hour doing things when when you really need to be resting. Um, one thing that does make it very difficult for children, especially to stay in bed if they wake up during the night, is if what they woke up from was a nightmare. Um, it can be good to have a plan in place for how to, you respond when your child has a nightmare for when they're having trouble sleeping. Um, they can make, uh, a lot of parents will use what's called monster spray, which is basically water and an essential oil, which again can incorporate that aromatherapy. And you'll say, okay, we're going to, as part of the bedtime routine, we're going to spray. So no matter what kind of dream you have, when you wake up, you know, there's no monsters because the spray keeps them away. Um, possibly giving kids the option, for example, that they have a pass that they can come and get the parent once a night to use the pass. So they kind of know that they have that option, but also sets that boundary of they're not coming every five minutes. And so they know that they have to be able to save it that way. Um, so kind of working through it that way. Also in the event of, you know, chronic nightmares, things like that, it's always good to, to get that checked out by a mental health professional, see if some treatment can help with that. Um, something that can be very helpful when getting into that restful state and going to sleep is a guided meditation or a guided visualization. Uh, there are apps, like there's an app that's just called Calm that is very helpful in um, guided visualization, guided meditations. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel called The Honest Guys that I actually really enjoy. Uh, and it's something that there are also written guided visualization. So if your child is having trouble falling asleep, um, you can read it to them or you can listen to one together. Um, it can be good to do it together without the parent reading it out loud because if you're listening to it together, the parent is doing the relaxation technique also. So they're showing the child, this is how we relax. This is what we're doing. You're modeling that for them. Um, and makes it a little bit easier if the child is getting distracted that the parent can redirect them without having to stop the activity. Um, these activities are the most restful when it's a familiar stimulus. Uh, so similar kinds of things each night, but it can be boring to have the same one every time. So it can be good to have a few different options to choose from. Uh, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, I'm just going to preface uh, before I start taking questions um, that although I am a psychologist, I, I am not able to specifically treat anyone over this, uh, this venue. So I'm happy to uh, answer questions you have about ADHD in general, ADHD assessment, uh, sleep hygiene, um, clarify anything that I've spoken about. Um, I just am not able to specifically give uh, treatment this way. So um, I don't see any in the Q&A, but it looks like there's all open up the chat. Is this PowerPoint available for reference? Um, I will be posting these slides on my website tomorrow, um, dramymarshall.com. And um, I will also on there have a link to this video. So the slides will be available in a PDF format um, as well as the video. You can go back and watch again. That'll be available tomorrow. Um, oh, yep, got an answer for that. Um, and yep, it'll also be on ADHDonline.com. And it looks like we're getting some questions. Um, suggestions for adults and sleep hygiene. So. Uh, basically, everything that I talked about for the bedtime ritual and the routine, um, the guided meditations, the aromatherapy sorts of things um, can all work for adults or for children. Um, the resource for the written guide. Yes. So the ones that I use a lot are there's an app called Calm um, and there is a YouTube channel called The Honest Guys. Um, those, are, but also if you search um, guided sleep meditation, a lot of free resources come up. Those are just ones that I happen to use. Um, is it a good idea to use melatonin to help if the child is having a hard time sleeping or even an adult? Um, so I, um, my degree is in psychology and not psychiatry. So I can't like specifically with medication. Um, it can, uh, as my understanding is it can be helpful to take melatonin. Um, my understanding is it's not habit forming, um, but if it's something that you find you're needing, you know, most nights or a lot of nights, I would definitely want to talk to the physician about um, whether, whether it's the right fit, whether it's helping. 
Um, if a child has ADHD and ODD, how do you get them to stay asleep? Um, so these kind of routines, they're not immediate fixes because a lot of it comes from that teaching your brain, this is how we fall asleep. So it does take some time for the brain to learn. These routines mean it's time to rest. These mean, these mean it's time to go to sleep, um, but over time can be helpful. A big thing, especially with, so ODD is oppositional defiant disorder, if anyone listening isn't familiar with that. Um, but it um, comes from, there's a lot of the impulse of, I want to do it my way and I want to be in control. Um, so something that's very helpful with that routine is letting them have a say in what it's going to be. So, you know, for example, do you want to, do you want to put your pajamas on first? Do you want to brush your teeth first? you know, um, what time should, you know, if, if your bedtime is eight o'clock, do you want to start the routine at 7.30 or 7.15 and kind of giving them that sense of control over it gets them more buy-in with it. Um, I know oppositional defiant behaviors can be very challenging. Um, the children with ODD do know that they feel better when they get more rest. So getting that buy-in can help them because they realize it does help them. It is, it is better, you know, I like to feel better. I like to get enough rest. Um, the child can't fall asleep alone, have to lie with him until he is asleep and then sneak out. Um, that potentially could be some, uh, it, depending on, again, you know, uh, not can't do specific treatment this way, but depending on if they are having trouble settling as, as like a hyperactive kind of feature or an anxiety kind of feature of, of I don't want you to leave, please stay with me. Um, either of those, I would suggest uh, seeing about getting your child in with the therapist to kind of see why they're not able to fall asleep alone and to set up a plan to help them to become more comfortable with that. Um, anyone else keep getting kicked off? Oh, I'm sorry, that is frustrating. Um, I don't know. Um, I hope not. Uh, but like I said, this will all be available online tomorrow. So um, should be able to go back and rewatch anything you miss. Um, and I will be putting the slides up too. So um, is there a free link where my son can answer questions if he does suffer with ADHD? Um, where he can, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, having trouble understanding the question. Uh, where he can, are you asking if he can ask questions about ADHD? Um, I, I know that there's a lot on ADHD online, a lot of resources about education, about ADHD, things like that. Um, and there are other, you know, like I said, we're recording this, we're going to be posting it later. There are some other webinars about ADHD that are free. Um, sleep hygiene. Yeah, if, if I oh, could, yeah. oh, if I could mention, um, yeah, absolutely. There is, um, I will post a link uh, to our website where we have uh, all the webinars that um, Dr. Marshall has um, provided uh, other helpful resources where we have most of the replays and we have also our blog post. Uh, but if you mean uh, 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 getting an assessment, um, our platform offers that. So you can also visit adhdonline.com um, for that as well. I'm sorry, Dr. Marshall. No, that's all right. You had the answer. <laughs> um, sleep hygiene for those that have trauma, child or adult. Um, so the same things of the rituals and the calming routines can help for trauma that help with ADHD. Um, Frankly, I would argue that anybody would benefit from having good sleep hygiene, having a good ritual in that sense. Um, and uh, so a lot of those kind of same things, it, the difference might be that someone with trauma might have specific uh, sensory or specific uh, calming kinds of needs that would help them, um, that, that would help them to feel calm, help them to feel safe and rest restful. Uh... Oh, sorry, it's, it's scrolling on me here. Uh, how do you determine what exactly is the right amount of time to sleep for your own needs? A um, little bit of trial and error, uh, figuring out at what point you feel the most rested. Um, if you are uh, basically exhausted all the time, as a lot of adults are, especially this past year, you might have, um, you might 
require a certain amount of time of needing more sleep than is typical for you. And that's because you're so exhausted. And it's kind of like when you're sick, you need more sleep. Um, and so that kind of helps you to wind down, uh, or sorry, helps you to determine, you know, get caught up and then kind of see, okay, I do feel rested after eight hours or, oh man, even once I've let myself rest, I'm just still exhausted unless I sleep for 10 hours. Um, to see if he's on the spectrum. Oh, uh, like an assessment for autism? Um, I don't believe ADHD online does autism assessments. Is that right? Um, so that would uh, usually, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we, um, I don't think it's for uh, autism. Um, we do uh, screen our set. Well, our assessment um, includes screening for anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you're looking at uh, getting testing for autism, usually your general doctor, primary physician is a good starting point because they um, get those kind of questions a lot and they, um, they will know at least who to refer to, who to talk to about getting that testing done. Um, was that the honest guys on YouTube? Yes, you did hear me correctly. The honest guy, honest, like honest, like honest and truthful. Yeah. <laughs> um, do essential oils help with sleep? Do weighted blankets help with ADHD? Uh, first essential oils can be with, like I said, with that aromatherapy, um, that, so I think it, they make like a pillow spray at Bath and Body Works is what I was thinking of, but I think there are like that you could just put the oil, like there's, if, uh, if you have a diffuser that that works for, um, but basically the smell. So, you know, like something calming, like lavender or chamomile or sandalwood. Um, and, oh, there was a second part of that question, I think, sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, weighted blankets. Um, weighted blankets can be helpful for ADHD um, because people with ADHD tend to um, oftentimes also have sensory issues. So that weighted blanket, that pressure can be very, very calming. Um, weighted blankets can also be helpful for ODD, autism. Um, you, if you can, it's good to test it out before you purchase one because the thing with sensory issues is they're different for each person. And for some people, it's like they're getting the best hug of their lives the entire night. And for others, they might feel like they're being suffocated. So if it's possible to try one out before you purchase it, um, but they can be very helpful for sleep. Um, what points do you have for those who fall asleep but often wake up after 3 a.m.? Um, so uh, like I had mentioned about if you wake up in the night, um, if you're able to just stay in bed and continue to rest, because if you're getting up when you wake up too early, that teaches your brain, this is when we get up. Um, if it's possible when you wake up in the night to not even check what time it is, that can help too, because uh, checking the time, again, then your brain thinks, oh, we wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, so being able to stay in bed and stay in that restful place and just say, okay, I am getting rest, even though I'm awake and this rest is helping me, even though I'm not, uh, even though I haven't fallen back asleep yet, um, can always tune on another, um, like I had mentioned about the honest guys, they have a couple of um, sleep meditations where they, um, they'll say, you know, as we're talking here at some point, you might fall asleep. And um, one of those I did once, and I don't actually know how it ends because I fell asleep about halfway through. Um, so that kind of thing can help talk you back to sleep. Um, are ADD adults more inclined to interrupt an insomnia? I believe so. Um, and that is something I would say, first of all, to be able to speak to um, your physician about if there's the option that um, if, if there's a medication need there. Um, but these kind of routines and rituals and sleep hygiene that we've been talking about um, can start to help teach your brain, okay, we go to sleep and we stay asleep. Uh, so it looks like those are all the questions that are on here right now. Got through them all. Yeah, well, I think um, with this, uh, we, can, we, we can wrap up our session. All right. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Marshall, thank you so much uh, for your expertise, your passion, and your support for our, our community. And um, 
So yeah, thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. Uh, we wanna encourage you if, uh, if you believe you may have ADHD uh, or would like to get diagnosed, diagnose, and diagnosis is so important is mm -hmm. one of the best steps to, um, to start receiving um, the support you need, the treatment you need. And our online platform is available uh, 24 seven. And um, you can go to ADHDonline.com, receive an evaluation for yourself or your child. And like I mentioned earlier, our assessment also includes screening for anxiety and depression. So um, this is all provided by li licensed uh, doctorate psychologists mm -hmm. uh, who are special, uh, specialized in ADHD. So uh, visit us if you have any questions, uh, visit us at ADHDonline.com or email us at info at ADHDonline.com. Uh, so thank you again. And uh, we will have this replay. I think we'll have this replay um, by Monday. Okay, perfect. But we will have uh, the replay. We will have the, um, the slides, the PDF slides also on the resources. Um, and um, just go to patient resources, drop down to uh, where we have our, our webinar uh, page and you will see all our webinars. And um, we, again, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Marshall, always a pleasure to see you. You too, thank you so much. And take care, bye-bye.